Well, Skip, you'll be happy to know that this is the last sermon in our Acts series. You have endured for five months, my friend. Good job. Good job. So it's our last sermon as we've gone through Acts. What I hope is that your intellect has grown in your knowledge of Acts and what was going on in that setting, but what I hope more is through these amazing stories that your heart has been transformed in some way, and that you have become closer to our Lord Jesus, and that your understanding of the Holy Spirit has grown as well. So I want to start with a, with a word this morning. No, no antonyms. I know some of you didn't like the antonyms of patience last week and were, probably went home and were looking through your the sources saying, is he really right about those words? Well, this week, I want to talk about this word, adventure. Here's what Webster, I don't know if Webster's got, got the corner on all the definitions, but here's the definition of this word adventure, the two main definitions. An undertaking usually involving danger and unknown risks. The second event, I mean, the second definition is an exciting or remarkable experience. All right, you adventurous people, how many of you like to live in the first definition? You like danger and unknown risks. Not very many of you. How many of you would like to live in the second one, exciting and remarkable experiences? Yay, most of you like to live there. I, I hope what you have seen in this entire story is adventure. You're surely going to see it today. What this week has afforded me is, is a flashback of amazing adventures, right, in my life. And, and some in Christ, some outside of Christ. And I could bore you or energize you with all of my boring, crazy stories of adventure. And I'm going to share only a couple. But, but it's remarkable of, of how God uses us in our time and how we have experiences that form and shape us, Right? I mean, we are who we are today because of the life we've lived. Some of it's been painful, some of it's been joyous, some of it's been monotonous, some of it's been dangerous and risk-taking and remarkable and exciting, but we are who we are today because of the adventures we've been allowed to experience. And I think how God took us, my family, while I was here in seminary with no job and led us on an adventure of providing for our family. Who would think that God could do that? But, but what an amazing adventure of watching God show up. Or I think I might have shared this, the adventure of, of when I was in, in Singapore long ago and was eating this amazing soup and the natives were looking at me, the business guys I was with, smiling when they finally told me I was eating fish bladder soup. I didn't ask for seconds, <laughs> even though the fish bladder soup was delicious. I guess it was a delicacy there, and, and it was delicious, but I will never eat it again. <laughs> or the time, this is probably more an adventure for my wife that recently, this was a couple years ago, we're whitewater rafting on class four rapids in Colorado and next to a canyon wall where the water then runs underneath, and my wife's in front of me paddling, and all I see is her rear sliding off and her heading in to that canyon. When I reached out and woof, grabbed her by her life jacket and brought her back. And I'm thinking, that was a great adventure. But for her, it was probably like, oh my gosh, yes, thank you for saving me as I got sucked in to the rapids. And, and I think about these amazing adventures. But I think when we think of life in Jesus, we think of monotony and boredom. I think we think of do's and don'ts, right? I've been in those churches where, where following Jesus was the do list and the don't list. Where following Jesus was about the proper morality or the proper people to hang out with. And I couldn't hang out with those people, but I could hang out with them. I couldn't go to that thing, but I could go to that thing. And it, it was more of a checklist. I hope if you've learned nothing else, is that life in the Spirit can be dangerous, risk-taking, exciting, and remarkable. Because we have seen all of that in this crazy story that we have been walking through. And so I hope your journey with Jesus, whether it was before, but I hope it is going forth as you are led by the Spirit, is exciting and remarkable. Life with Jesus is not boring. 
or monotonous. It's not about the rules. It's not about the do's and the don'ts. It's about following him wherever he wants to lead us. And so as I think about this story today, for sure, for sure, as, as Marissa said, it is a sea story that is outrageous, which we'll get to in a minute. I, I started to think about the entirety of Acts. And I love simplicity, right? I love to break down complexity into simplicity. And so, of course, in my brain, I'm thinking, God, how can we break Acts down from 1 to 28 into a few words? What would be an easy thing to remember about this story? And so the first one is this. This is a story of adventure. Again, I don't think we read the Bible like that, right? We read it like, oh my gosh, these people live. They did this stuff. What can I learn? Okay, let's take it from there and go on with it. But what if we opened it up? This amazing book we've been given and read it that way. And reread Acts even, and we're like, oh my gosh, this is a crazy story. Following Jesus is a life of adventure. But what's the second word? Now, you don't have to have this as your word of what stands out to you in Acts. It definitely comes out today, but as I was thinking through this entire story, right, I could have come up with a story about Jesus. We could have said it, as we said in the early stages of this series it's a gospel of the spirit it's all about the holy spirit we could come up with salvation love but the word that really stands out to me that i think encompasses all of that is this it's a story of hope it's a story of hope in jesus and that a group of crazy adventure taking disciples who were filled with the power of the spirit said yes to that spirit and took this crazy, amazing message about Jesus Messiah and the hope that he can bring to a dying world. And we see them talk and proclaim hope throughout this entire story. And I'm wondering in our modern church today if we're more caught up and we just got to get people saved or we just have to tell them about Jesus or we just have to they just have to sit and listen to us instead of walking with people who no one's walking with instead of listening to people who no one listens to instead of feeding people who are struggling to eat instead of housing people who need to be housed instead of bringing physical healing emotional healing spiritual healing to people and providing a story of hope because the story of Jesus in your life is a story of hope the story of Jesus in my life is a story of hope as I think about where I was and how Jesus has led me and the things and the adventures he's led me on and how he's picked me up even as I followed him and I've gone back to the valley and he's picked me up again and I've dove deep in the water and he's picked me up again it's consistently a story filled with hope. And I want and hope, hope that that is the message that we convey to those around us. It's easy to preach at people. It's easy to tell them what they need to do different. It's easy to tell them how they need to live. But just to be present and testifying about the hope that Jesus has given you. Which, by the way, if we're going to go back to the beginning here in a bit, we come, we come back to it again, is Jesus said testify. And what is testifying? Giving my story about the hope Jesus has given me. I'm not giving Chuck's story or Kim's story or Corky's story. I'm giving my story. Testifying is giving my story and letting the Holy Spirit show up in those who receive my story. And so turn to your Bibles. Acts 27 and 28. There's a Bible in the pew if you want to take a look at that. This is an outrageously detailed, crazy, seafaring story. There is no other story like this in Acts. Scholars question why does Luke in the last two chapters give all of this detail about Paul getting from point A to B to C to D to E in no other place in Acts does Luke go in to this kind of detail but in this closing of this amazing crazy letter boy you we're not going to read it all but I hope you read 27 and 28 man it is a detailed story of adventure on the high seas now some scholars would say that the significance of it is, is that, that Luke needs to put himself in the story. So we see we all throughout this to make his history, book of history and acts credible. 
that he needs to make sure he's a part of the story in places throughout. And so he's given the details because apparently he's present. Others would say, and, and would, would, might agree with that, might not agree with that, that there were sea stories throughout that Hellenistic culture for centuries. And even in that modern time, and that, that Luke is, is using that, the literature of the day even, and the literature of the past, to tell this amazing story of this amazing adventure of Paul. And so let's take a look at 27 and 28. And I'm just going to point a few things out. Now, what we first want to get is Paul's already been on the high seas. Okay, he's taken a other, couple of other journeys that we know in Acts that he's traveled on the, the Mediterranean, and I'm sure in his in life maybe he's done that as well. So Paul knows the seas, but he's not a sailor. Any, any sailors? Okay, so he's not a sailor, right? So let's take a look at what he says. First off, I want to start in verse 3 of chapter 27, because we get introduced to this centurion, Roman centurion, Julius, who Luke tells us right away treats Paul kindly. Right, significant aspect of this story, right? And again, I want us to embrace this because I think a lot of times, I'm not suggesting this is us, right? But I want us to get, as, as we think, only people in the body of Christ can treat people kindly, right? But, but God uses everybody in his creation to be a part of what he's up to. Verse 6. So there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria. So they switch ships, right? So they're on the first ship. They get to a spot. They get off the ship. The centurion goes and finds them another ship that's going to take them to Italy. So I want to make sure we get that. It's not always the same ship, okay? And so they find another ship, and they're heading off for Italy. They get on board. They're, they're sailing along the coast. They're, they're doing their thing. And then we get to verse 9. Since much time had passed, and the voyage was now dangerous, because even the fast was already over the time of year, Paul advised them. So Paul pulls together the, the centurion, maybe the owner of the ship, maybe the captain, and Paul says, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. Is Paul giving a prophetic word here? Is Paul being led by the Spirit? What is, you know, it doesn't say that, but we sure get the idea that Paul's saying, look, here's the deal. Or maybe Paul's saying, hey, I've been on the high seas. I, but he's saying, look, there's going to be loss of ship and loss of lives. Centurion pays more attention to the pilot, to the owner of the ship, and they keep going. And then starting in verse 13, which I encourage you to read, this crazy story begins of life on the high seas at a time when you shouldn't be on the high seas. And then we get to verse 21. And Paul gives the entire ship that's believing life is ending soon, he gives them hope. He says, men, after he tells, tells them, I told you so. Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Okay, because I've been throwing stuff overboard. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. So Paul says, look, the ship's going to go, but all of us, we're going to stay alive. Why do you say this, Paul? For this very night there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and to whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. Right? The Lord already told, we already read that passage, right? A couple of weeks ago, the Lord already told Paul, you're going to Rome. Paul says, we probably shouldn't sail on. They sail on anyway. It's not looking good. Lord reminds Paul, you're going to Rome. I got you. I got you. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all, passengers of this ship, who have the privilege of sailing with me. So take heart. For I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run around, run aground on some island. When have you had that confidence in Jesus? When you have had, have you had that confidence in something the Lord told you? Whether He told you in a time of prayer, whether He told you through another believer, whether He told you through Scripture. When have you proclaimed that confidence in what the Lord said to you was actually what was going to happen? And I'm, I'm challenged by this because I'm wondering, do we walk around with this type of faith? Do we walk around believing what the Lord speaks to us? Do we walk around believing the Lord said, hey, you're going to live. Okay, I'm going to live and I'm going to tell everybody I'm going to live. 
or you're going to get through this, okay, I'm going to get through this, or do we walk around in doubt all the time thinking, well, I know he told me that, but, you know, I'm not sure he's going to come through. Or, you know, I feel like he came through last time. Or, right, whatever it might be. But to live in this kind of faith. By the way, we're in about 60 A.D. If Paul was converted in 34, right, Paul's been following Jesus now for 26 years, and his faith is steadfast. His faith is deep because he continually sees the Lord show up. It hits me. That's why adventure in Jesus is important. If I never take adventure, I never have reason to trust. If I never step out in faith, I never need to trust that God will carry me through. If I live a life that's of fear and protection and always trying to guard, then I never know that Jesus will show up when I need him to. Church, we've been called to live a, well, I, don't, I hope not this crazy, but a crazy life in the Lord, following wherever he might take us and trusting in his provision, trusting that he will be present. doesn't mean you're not going to get hurt sometimes. Paul surely got hurt. He got stoned near death. He's been beaten with rods. He's been in prison, but it hasn't stopped him from trusting and following Jesus. And what I found in my life, when I say yes to a small adventure with Jesus, I get a bigger adventure next time. When I say yes to that adventure in Jesus, I get a bigger one the next time. And he keeps saying, well, what do you think now? What do you think? What do you think? Are you going to follow? Are you going to follow? Are you going to follow? He's just asking us to say, trust me, and say yes. And Paul's saying, look, I heard from the Lord. You all are going to be okay. So they keep going. Jump to verse 31. Paul says to the centurion and the soldiers, because some guys are throwing some, the lifeboats over. Like, they're like, we've got to save ourselves. Even though Paul said it's going to be okay, let's get the lifeboats. And Paul says, look, unless these men stay in the ship, we're not going to be saved. So the soldiers listen to Paul, and they cut the ropes. Goodbye, lifeboats. Not going to need those. And then Paul once again brings them hope. Verse 33, as day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today's the 14th day that you've continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength. For not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, it sounds like he's sharing the Lord's Supper with a bunch of I want you to get this now. Now, I know you're all going to be, her, you're going to call me a heretic, but he's sharing the Lord's Supper with a whole bunch of people that don't follow Jesus. Mm. Shut up, Pastor. Some of you are thinking, Right? He's saying, look, the presence of God is here when we engage in this meal together. Come on. And when he took, and we said these things, he took the bread and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and they began to eat. They shared this food and this meal together. They had no idea they were what Paul might be directing, but the language, the scholars would read this Greek, would say, man, this sounds like Lord's Supper language. They don't know it. They're just eating but imagine bringing the Lord's Supper spirit in language into a group that never met Jesus. Maybe they might in that moment. They all were encouraged by the hope that Paul has, and they ate food themselves. Luke says there's 276 of us on this ship. That's a lot of people that are about to be saved. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, and now they threw the wheat off. And then the shipwreck. And they're getting ready. The ship is struck in, a, in verse 41, but striking a reef. They ran the vessel aground, and it's breaking apart. And the soldiers, verse 42 says, plan to kill the prisoners. Because if the prisoners escape, the soldiers are going to die when they get back to their posts. But our buddy Julian, who's been kind to Paul from the very beginning, this Roman centurion says, hey, you know what? Let's not do that. They didn't carry out the plan, and they jump overboard. Those that could swim, swim. Others grab onto planks, and they make their way to land. And 276 sailors, because Paul said, I got to get there, and God told me he's going to save you all too, gave them hope. They all survived. Unbelievable. I'm thinking it through that. Like, would I be thinking only of myself, or would I be thinking of the 276? I mean, as I'm in the storm and the ship's breaking up and God said, they're all going to be saved, but I trust God enough to say, you're all going to be saved. Would I be like, hey, I think you're going to be saved. Boom, lifeboat, here I come. And then they get to this island of Malta where these Maltese people who don't have to, 
show amazing hospitality. By the way, during this time of year, the weather is about 50 degrees. You've been in the water. You come out. I don't know if you've been in the, in the water for a long time when it's 50 degrees outside, and now it's raining on you and you hit the beach. Not too long before hypothermia is going to take care of you. But the Maltese show up, not knowing that you 276, many of you are prisoners. And they build fires for you, and they provide you food, they get you some blankets, they take care of you, not even knowing who you are. Boy, that's a lesson in hospitality I think we all could learn. Not even knowing who the people are, not even thinking, you're, such a, you're, you're imposing on me now, man, it's raining outside, I don't want to come on the rain with you. I don't even know what you're here for. And then the leader of the group takes Paul into the village with some others. Paul notices the guy's father is sick. What does Paul do? In the name of Jesus. Brings healing. People find out. Oh, they bring others. What does Paul do? In the name of Jesus. That's hope, my friends. Healing, these folks hadn't seen. Do we believe in that type of power in the Spirit? to bring that type of hope. Now, I know some, some people would want to say, did they get saved? Did they get saved? They were in the presence of the Holy God through Paul in those. I think God was up to something. He brought hope to this situation. And then Paul makes it to Rome. They finally find another ship. And they get to Rome. And we find out something else crazy. There's already Christians in Rome. And we don't even know who took the words to Rome. So we get this story of Paul and Luke and Silas and Barnabas, and there's a plethora of other workers in the Lord that are taking the message in the gospel places unnamed throughout history who are on this crazy adventure as well. Then Paul calls says, I want to get together with the Jewish leaders. And, there, and he says, surely you know me. They're like, we don't even know who you are. Nobody sent us a letter. We don't, we don't know anything about you. What we know is about this movement the way, and everybody doesn't like them. And so Paul shares the hope in Christ. And he shares who Jesus is. And he shares about the gospel. And every place Paul goes, right? Look at verse 24. This seems to be the same thing that happens every place Paul goes, and it's probably in the places we go to, right? We, some were convinced, but others didn't. Some were convinced, others didn't believe, Right? Not going to bat a thousand in our sharing of the gospel of Jesus. But it shouldn't stop us from sharing the gospel of Jesus. It shouldn't stop us from testifying about who he is. And then in Paul's beautiful words, as always, he tells them what's going to happen to them according to the prophet Isaiah and says, you know what? If you're not going to listen, the Gentiles will. And then we get this crazy last verse. Now imagine Acts was the only story you had about Jesus. And you got to the end and you read verse 30 and 31. You'd be like, what happened to Paul? What happened to these guys? We don't get any other story except he's there taking care of himself and here's what he's doing. But maybe the point is, is the story hasn't ended. In Acts is a story that's being written by you today and being lived by you. And through the last, what, 200,000 years or 2,000 years is we've been living the story of Acts. It's never ended. Because here's what he says. He lived there two whole years at his own expense. That's intriguing. So he's in kind of house arrest, but he's having to pay for himself. And welcomed, look at what it says, all who came to him. I want us to hear that. The Maltese welcomed all who came to them. Centurion Julius welcomed Paul and the other prisoners. And Paul, sitting in Rome, waiting to stand before Caesar, welcomes everyone who comes. Doesn't put any rules on it, doesn't say how they need to change, doesn't say they need to do this first. Everybody is welcome. And what did he do? He proclaimed. Jesus, the kingdom of God and the teaching of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, with boldness and without any hindrance. And that's our story. That's what we're all called to, right? As we, as we think about this story of where actually Marjorie started this many months ago, right? When she gave the first sermon in Acts. 
and we looked at this passage, every one of us is called to be a witness. Every one of us is called to testify. And every one of us is called to live this life of adventure for the sake of the gospel. Every one of us. But then this is where it ends. Every one of us is to be welcoming to everyone. Proclaiming the good news, which is a message of hope to the world. That's it. In the midst of this crazy story of the movement of the Holy Spirit, in the movement of God as the church grows and explodes across the Roman Empire, spreading everywhere, not just because of Paul, Barnabas, or Silas, or Luke, but because of a bunch of those who have said yes to Jesus, unnamed people, the gospel today is still being spread. And it's now on us to continue the story of Acts. To be filled with the power of the Spirit, taking the message out. Some of us are going to be on the high seas. Some of us are going to be in here in, in Ypsilanti. Some of us are going to be called someplace else. Some of us, wherever the Lord calls us. But I want to encourage you to allow the Spirit to be your guide and leader. Our flesh can get in the way. Allow the Spirit to lead you on the grandest adventure that you could ever live, one in Christ, following the Spirit, testifying about who He is and who you are because of Him. Amen? Amen. The band's going to come and lead us in our seafaring song, Oceans. But what I want you to pray about as we prepare to, to listen is are you open, right? I mean, this really, this is a story about saying yes, right? Along the way, these, these spirit-filled disciples could have said no. And history would have been different than it is today. Along the way, these disciples in the first century, in the second century, the third century, the fourth century, all the way up till now, disciples can say no. And history changes. But because disciples of Jesus say yes to Him and the Spirit within them, we become part of the story. We become a part of history changing for the sake of the gospel. So let's live our acts. Let's not just watch it from the sideline. Let's just not hope to read about it one day. Let's live it. These three ladies we honor today have lived acts, right? They have lived the gospel proclaiming it, teaching it, being on grand adventures with the one who saved them. Let's be those people. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for grand adventures in you. Thank you, Jesus, for the privilege of being counted on by you. Maybe we've only impacted, maybe, only. It's not even only. That's a silly thing I said. But Lord, what if we have impacted only one person in our life? Man, that's life-changing. That, that's legacy-changing. Lord, we're, we're all not going to be Paul's or Barnabas's or Silas's or I can start naming people throughout history. But what we have learned from Acts, there's a whole bunch of people that we never know who they are that spread the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. Holy Spirit, may we live in the power that you have given us. And may we be ready and willing and available to testify to the hope that only Jesus can give. Whenever we're called upon, whatever that might look like, wherever that might be, and to whomever that might be with. In Jesus' name.